says the meeting's live. I'm going to assume we're live. There's always like this weird 30 second delay where I don't know what's going on and the interwebs and the workings of the world get yes. me confused. I would have never gotten out of, out of the matrix. That's the moral of this story. Um, <laughs> it would it would have never happened. Okay, uh, we're definitely live. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, it is Monday. It is uh, November, which is crazy to me. I feel like I woke up, like I went to bed in June and I woke up and it's November and I'm like, what happened to fall? Um, my OSU Cowboys are on a hot streak. Uh, my arch nemesis has finally dropped a game. I'm feeling great on a Monday today. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people that maybe aren't feeling great. However, you're walking in to the live feed tonight. We, we just want to meet you where you're at, whether you're struggling, whether you're in a great place, all are welcome. Um, I'm excited about, uh, the show tonight. So if you, uh, well, actually let's start here. You're watching live on Facebook because uh, that's the only place we're live streaming. That's the, you have to be watching live on Facebook unless you're watching it not live. Uh, reach up, click the share button, uh, share this to your news feed. Everybody asks me all the time, hey, what's something we can do to help support your organization? This is it. Share the content. It's free. It exponentially increases the amount of people that hear the message that we've got. And quite literally, it can save somebody's life. Let's say on average, you've got 750 friends on your Facebook feed. Um, research says that, you know, maybe 30 to 35% of them are going to be struggling with the substance use disorder or have a family member struggling with the substance use disorder. And that's a lot of people. So sharing this feed could actually send out a message of hope that somebody really needs to hear tonight. So if you're not familiar with Parents Helping Parents, we're an Oklahoma-based 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we've got one mission. We want to provide education, resources, and shared experiences to parents who have a child any age that might be struggling with a substance use disorder. So you might have a 13 year old who's just now starting to experiment with drugs and alcohol. You might be the parent of a 55 year old who's uh, had a drug and alcohol problem for a number of years. And this is a place for both of those people. Uh, we wanna help you at all levels uh, and at all, all the way through that journey. And you know, we don't have any professional expertise or experience. You know, none, none, nothing that we do should be considered professional counseling, legal advice, financial advice, medical advice. We'll help you find those if you need them. But what we do is we offer the experiences that, that we've had. We share those experiences. We try to connect you with some resources in your area. And we try to provide a little bit of education. Um, and we just want to walk with you through that journey. So this live stream that we do uh, twice a month, first and third Monday of the month, is really a great way for you to connect with us and get to know a little bit about our organization and kind of hear some of the things that are talked about at our meetings. But Parents Helping Parents hosts lots of live meetings all across the state of Oklahoma, from Tulsa to Norman and everywhere in between. If there's a meeting of people in your area, we really want to encourage you to connect with them. This is a great place to get support, to ask questions, to get information. But I promise you there's nothing better than being in a room full of people that's trying to offer you support and that's trying to offer you care um, some of our groups are meeting physically. Some of our groups are still meeting in private Zoom rooms, but you can find all of that information on our website, www.parentshelpingparents.info. Or if you're watching this uh, later on YouTube, you can follow us on Facebook at Parents Helping Parents Inc. and get all the information about upcoming events and meetings and all of the fun stuff that we do along the way. Um, I'm really excited about tonight. Uh, we've got Eddie Fisher joining us. I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself um, here in a couple minutes and tell us more about who he is and where he comes from. But if you saw our advertisement on Facebook, one of the things uh, that I said about Eddie is that it's my understanding that he's, he's a really like high quality amateur pizza chef. He's actually in Oklahoma City visiting on work, even though we're doing this remotely. He's like, you said you're staying in the Sheridan. I'm, I live right over by the Capitol. So we're really like, we're like three miles apart right now, right? <laughs> um, but my question, Eddie, is while you're in Oklahoma City, what pizza places have you tried locally? Which ones measure up and, and do you need recommendations? You know, I'm going to need recommendations. I get have- a, Get a pen and paper ready, man. I can eat pizza every day. I can eat pizza every day too. Now I've been, a few have been suggested to me, but I have not hit them. Oh, wait, there was a place. Yes, no, I did go to a good place. 
it was like uh, down below. Oh, gosh, I can't, I can't explain it. Um, it was, it was actually really good. Neapolitan style. Um, You'd have to give me the name. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what places are down below. It, it's kind of like, it, it, it felt real, you know, modern. Oh, yeah. Goodness. I'm going to have to figure that out. I did go. It was good, but um give me what what places have people suggested i'll tell you if they lied to you or not oh my goodness there's one in bricktown area i think that someone recommended <sighs> yeah this place is garbage um it, there's a new one in bricktown that was really good when they opened it's already gone downhill really? um here's my top three and i'll you, you you can try them and you can give me the 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 pro-am uh rundown on what you think um Hall's Pizza Kitchen in Midtown, which is on 10th Street, not too far from you. Okay. H-A-L-L -L apostrophe S, Hall's Pizza Kitchen. Quality. Um, the best buy the slice place in town for like a New York style slice is Empire Slice House. Empire Slice House. Yep. 16th Street in Plaza. Okay. I like a slice because, you know, yep. where I'm from back east. Yeah, the slice, you know, then you fold it in the grease. Yeah, that's how, yeah, that's how Empire is. Empire is a folded okay. place. Okay. Halls, Halls is more of a uh, specialty wood fire pizza grill. I think that's um, where we ate. Yeah, it's, it's quality. Um, yeah. And then there's a new one that maybe even a lot of people listening haven't been to yet. It's only a couple months old. It's kind of up on Western and maybe Britain Road, which isn't far. It's still in the urban core but it's called Vins, V-I-N-N -N apostrophe S. All right. And man, I got a pizza from there that was, it had three different types of pepperoni on it. It had ground pepperoni, fried pepperoni, and then cubed pepperoni sausage. And it blew my mind. It was delicious. Vins. Yeah, Vins. So if you're watching in the Facebook feed, comment your pizza recommendations for Eddie while he's in town so that he can give us uh, the rundown on pizza. And then... Uh, I know Eddie's got a lot of great stuff to share with us about recovery. So Eddie, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to shut my camera down. I'm going to give you the floor for a little bit, man, um, to speak to our peeps. That's fantastic, Derek. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Derek. Um, that's a lot of fun. Great way to open up a meeting to talk about pizza. Um, I love doing it. It's been a big part of my recovery, actually. Uh, dough making, I had found to be such a therapeutic process. Um, I'm an old guy, so you know I like to put on a little Louis Prima, and I make a 72-hour cold fermented dough, and I just find uh, it to be a great escape and a, and a wonderful relaxation uh, hobby for me, and there's nothing better uh, than cooking, you know, for, for others and just putting a big smile on their face. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when I do tours at the place that I work at Casa Kalina treatment, um, I'll make our guests pizza. It's part of the tour. And, um, my favorite actually was we do, uh, a very, uh, deep two day intensive. The guys do. And I came in and made pizza for the guys after that intensive. And I got to tell you, you know, to look somebody in the eye and just say, it's an honor and a privilege to cook for you and, you know, keep going. Um, I am 15, a little, you know, over 15 years clean and sober. Um, you know, have grown up in, 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 in a lot of addiction, um, a lot of unhealthy uh, behaviors and bound and boundaries, um, back East. I don't know if there are boundaries. I don't even know if that's in the dictionary back East, you know, especially in, on the Italian side. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been a, a, a wonderful way to connect, um, from my childhood. Yes. I'm stereotype. My uncle Rocky, uh, owned a pizza place in Jersey. And my mom used to, I had birthday parties there and I'd go there and make boxes. My uncle would pay me a nickel a box to make the pizza boxes. That's how old I am. And, um, 
and uh, my grandmother worked there. Um, I, I used to work with her some days in, in the shop and I, and I loved it. Um, things kind of come full circle about our passions and, and just, you know, how we were raised. So I, I'm into it all, the dough, the cheese. Um, just recently, uh, Derek, I had a, a, one of the guys that was featured on Barstool Sports, the pizza reviews that uh, Dave Portnoy does several years ago. I connected with a Jersey pizza maker and he happened to be in Dallas um, and he came to my house and uh, we made pizzas till midnight. And my poor wife, who's from Minnesota and an introvert, was just like, oh, me, you, you know, she sat there and watched this whole thing unravel, you know, unravel. It was so much fun. That's such a gift of recovery. And I think that's a great way to segue into what I love talking about so much is fellowship, kind of finding your tribe. And whether you're a newcomer or you've been, you know, at this for a little bit, you know, there's, there's, it's so important to talk about finding your tribe. And I think that sometimes finding that tribe and finding different tribes as you progress to when you get in to, you know, as you, as you kind of go about your journey, um, you know, it's just really so important because when you put yourself out there and you have that surrender moment, you know, the doors that open, the, the God shots, the, the moments of, of, wow, you can't make this stuff up, you know, really, really do happen. And, you know, I, I do want to bring it back to the beginning because it's so important. You know, I, I didn't want to talk to anybody and I'm, I'm an extrovert, but when it came to going into AA, um, you know, when it came to talking to those people or, you know, going, I didn't want any part of it. Um, and until, but when that surrender came and I actually wanted to go, you know, wow, what a beautiful, beautiful opportunities, you know, where, where, where it has taken me. And then what you learn from all of that, and you can give that away you know, to so many people. And then you, you, you have this, this wonderful kind of dash behind the dash, right? You, you all these wonderful things that you see and you get inspired from um, is just such a, a, a wonderful gift of putting yourself out there. And, you know, it's, it's so tough in the beginning. There, there's, there's so many things that I know I struggled with, um, you know, it's, it, it's that big, like, it's like drop the rock, right? Or you're holding that, that rope and, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's nylon and your hands are bleeding, but you're still hanging on, you know, you just don't want to give, give up and, and let it go. And when you do let it go and uh, you walk in uh, to a, you know, a new door, wow. It, it, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I've just been such a beneficiary of such wonderful people that said they were all waiting for me. And they really are. They're, they're, there is somebody and a group out there waiting for you to walk through a door. So, you know, how, you know, how do you do that? Right? Well, you know, depending on, on, you know, for, for parents, right. Al-Anon is, is, is a phenomenal place. Um, parents helping parents is, is a phenomenal, you, you walk in and what, what I've always said is, is that I can walk into a room anywhere in the world and feel welcomed and comfortable. And, um, and if anybody is like, Oh, I, you know, give it a shot. Um, walk through a door, um, ask for help, um, you know, and do the very best that you can where you're at. 
Um, no one, no one forces you to, to sit there and bear your soul or, you know, there's so many wonderful people that will meet you where you're at. And then you can get comfortable and, and accustomed to that. Um, you know, and, and, and then something occurs where the groups that I know I didn't want to be a part of, all of a sudden they start working. <laughs> And, and, and the energy, you know, because I came to uh, believe, right, um, I surrendered, um, I believed and made a decision that, you know, I'm, I'm going to need to change everything and I'm going to need to find some new avenues and some new ways to, to, to connect. And, you know, I connected really, really well in bars, right? So I removed those things. And um, wow, there's a big hole there. And I'm not a therapist. So I, I do want to say that too. I mean, from my belief is if I don't replace those holes with something good, then I'm in a lot of trouble because, you know, bars fulfilled my life. Like I got fellowship, um, banter, uh, you know, all the things that I, you know, I loved were, were in that place. And I had to remove that place if I was going to live. And then, you know, who wants to be miserable? I don't, I didn't get sober to be miserable. So, you know, when I walked into the group, they, they'll always talk about, because people say, well, you know, these meetings. Well, I want to share something that I, I, I'm just so passionate about. It's called the meeting before the meeting or the meeting after the meeting. And, you know, in finding your tribe and, 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 and finding fellowship, this is really where, for me, I really saw the goodness and what this is all about, um, you know, and I had a lot, had to do a lot of work and work in those rooms, the, the, the work that, that works. However, a group of men, now one thing I did do was I got a home group, right? So this was the meeting that I never missed. This was the meeting really where I went deeper with people, right? I really got to know them. And I got invited to a dinner before the meeting. And it was, um, I got sober in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, uh, April 13th, 2006. And I got invited to an old steakhouse with, with, with a bunch of guys. And I went and I, and I said, yes, I was desperate and I know I needed help. So I was saying yes to just about everything. Um, which could be overwhelming at first, but saying yes was just such an important part. And I went to this dinner and I sat down with these men who had the table, a running reservation for 18 years, 18 years. So I heard that and I says, well, you know, things that stand the test of time must be good. You know, things that are really good um, stay the course, right? So I sat there with all these, these guys and they had all these years of sobriety. Um, but it really wasn't about that. It was about the laughter. So I'm sitting in this, this, this group of men and they laughed and laughed. One guy had such a contagious laugh. I'll never forget him. His nickname was Bone Dry. And, uh, you know, I, I, I listened to the banter. I listened to the guy stuff that us guys like. And it was like being in the bar, but nobody was drinking. And I was so fascinated by being together with a bunch of men and laughing and having a great time and nobody was getting loaded. Like that was a foreign thing. I mean, when guys got together, 
you drank and that's what you did. But this group provided such an eye-opening experience for me that when I got up and we all were going to the meeting, I said, maybe I could do this. So your tribe and fellowship provides such hope. And, you know, it, it, it was incredible. I just kept showing up and showing up. And it's okay if a group maybe doesn't work out the first time, give it another shot or try another group, you know, continue to push yourself, you know, in those manner. I mean, I kept going every Monday for that dinner. And then the guys asked me if I would, you know, be of service. And, you know, there was a gentleman who was on Normandy beach. He was in his eighties and, and he had a walker and I had to pick him up and take him to dinner. And then I had a little bit of purpose. So the tribe and the fellowship provided, you know, purpose. So here's another thing, which really spoke to me, right? And, and then I also learned. So just a tremendous, you know, way that I found that tribe and that fellowship. And it carried me because then I was able to build relationships through that and talk to guys about what was going on. And the one thing great about that tribe and that fellowship was they understood what I was going through. I was able to build somewhat of a board of directors through that. You know, so one guy was really good. He was, got, you know, stayed married through sobriety. Um, you know, so he knew what I was going through in, in marriage. And then there was a guy that, you know, was really good in, the, the fellowship itself that I could talk to. The one thing I will encourage too is, is that find that tribe that's going to keep you accountable. That's, that's, that's also going to push you a little bit and, and have empathy, but not always sign off on, like for me, my complaining and my whining. I, I also needed truth in my life. So when you do find that tribe and, and you feel like that's going to be it and you're going to go deeper with people and you're really going to talk to people, you know, that's kind of what we're looking for, right? We need truth. We need guidance, you know, and um, I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, the next uh, tribe that I was able to find um, was with my alumni in my treatment center. And so I went I was doing my step work and I got invited to the 24th anniversary alumni party of my treatment center. And my sponsor suggested that I go because I had resentments to treatment. So I said, yes. And I drove there and went and I got connected with a whole new tribe and a whole new group we had something at our treatment center where there was an alumni volunteer or two in every state. So uh, I had to call my alumni contact while I was in treatment to tell them when I was getting out and I connected, but I relapsed after treatment and I fell off. Um, but I, that, this is what brought me back in. And um, my goodness, what a blessing it was. I'm still friends with several of those folks today. They welcomed me, encouraged me, and then I became a volunteer in Scottsdale for 10 years. I mean, what, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful tribe, you know? So locally, nationally, like these things start building and there's nothing better, like no matter, no matter what city I go to, I can call somebody. I could call two people. I could have a cup of coffee with somebody. Um, you know, all from just saying yes and putting myself out there in a different way. Um, so I'm just, you know, really grateful for fellowship to me. If someone were to say, what's that one thing? Like, what's the one thing that, 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 it's fellowship and, and it, it's done so much for me in my life. It's enriched it. And, 
I want to tell you, I went in kicking and screaming. You know, I didn't want to be bothered with these people. I mean, and I say it that way because I hear that thread so much. I don't want to go to these meetings, you know, or this isn't my problem. So why should I have to do that? I just want to encourage you to take a step back, take a breath, and just listen to what I'm saying on what doors can open for you and, and, and the things that, you know, will happen as a result of you walking through a door and finding your tribe. You know, it's, uh, it's an incredible, it, it, it's the, the biggest, greatest networking party you could ever be a part of. Um, and uh, there isn't, there, there's so many people that I know that will do anything for someone in recovery, whether it's on the family side or the, you know, personal side. Um, and there's so much, you know, uh, wonderful. As, as it evolved for me, you know, there's some different things that I did get engaged with. Um, leadership training. Um, so I encourage everybody too, because I think when we get into recovery, especially early, I mean, I, I know I could raise my hand. I'm, I'm sure Derek, I mean, you're going to get a book list like this. Oh, you got to read this book. Oh, you got to read this book. You know, it gets a little bit overwhelming. Um, and then sometimes we dive in so much and so heavy that I want to encourage everybody you know, to, to find a tribe, maybe healthy, maybe outside of recovery, you know, that, that gives you some balance and that you're not always talking about certain subjects and certain topics. Um, I've expanded for myself. I, I expanded that and uh, got involved in some leadership training, which provided different intensives and um, process groups. And uh, it, it was wonderful to get out of the recovery bubble a little bit and put myself out there, you know. So someone who's been doing this for a while, that you know, I want to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone again. You've come so far and you're doing so well, you know. Push yourself outside your comfort zone. You'll get you'll 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 get tremendous growth. I I love the saying, "Get out there on the." skinny branches because that's where the good fruit is so um well yeah man you so you said it you've said a ton of great things um eddie and i want to i want to highlight a couple of them and then i want to ask you for some details on a couple of them but um you know i think one of the things you said that i think is really powerful is that it's okay for you to have a tribe of recovering people and have another tribe that's different, right? And I think a lot of times people get stuck in kind of a vacuum chamber of, hey, it's all this or it's all that and, and nothing can be in between. And for me, a real picture of like healthy community looks way more like a Venn diagram right? Where you've got these overlapping circles of, Hey, I've got, I've got people that are in my tribe that are of all flavors, you know, and some of them there's crossover and some of them that there's not, but what they all have in common is they, the one thing they all have in common is they all care enough about me to be honest with me and to hold my feet to the fire, whether there's somebody from my tribe that I met in a 12 step program or somebody that from a tribe, my tribe that I met in church, or maybe it's, maybe I've still got tribe members I went to high school with, you know, and old relationships that have stuck with me, you know, and all of those people are valuable for our formation, right? Absolutely. And it's really, I think it's really important because I know what I did was I thought, okay, I have to shut down a piece. And, you know, I think that too, when you're working really hard and you start really doing the work, you'll get a feel for when it's time to start branching out. You know, there was a time where I needed to focus in on just one tribe, you know, and I had to get that yeah. foundation and that footing. And then as, as I progressed and, and, you know, it's interesting too, Derek, right? Like even certain meetings, like 
you can grow out of a meeting. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really good because ultimately we are responsible for our own recoveries. Yeah. You know, and I think um, people pleasing and uh, all those things that we bring in, right? Oh, you know, but, you know, I've actually did that where I went and got a new home group. I moved on another side of town and I put myself out there. And, you know, when I moved to Texas, you know, I had to put myself out there and, and, you know, and do that you know, at, at my church, people got to know me a different way and, and then got to know my story, you know, six, seven years into my journey. Right. Yeah. So all those things, all those worlds can collide. I, I, I really though, owe a, a wonderful therapist, um, that really sat me down and said, listen, one man, one person cannot be everything. You cannot make a person, your higher power, because nobody's perfect. And you'll, you'll end up being let down. And, you know, so many that that thread in recovery, you know, where, you know, who's nobody's perfect, right? No one could live up to the expect expectations or premeditated resentments. Yeah. <laughs> so get a board of directors, if a company does it, why shouldn't you? Yeah, you know, get five, six people around you you know, that, that all do something really well. And um, yeah, I love that. That's great. What do you, what do you think Eddie, in terms of what you see typically and what your experiences has taught you, what are some of the big barriers that people have that prevent them from engaging in that type of fellowship and that type of community? The biggest resistance, I think one is denial. Two there's still, still some sort of, there is a stigma to like, I don't want to be with those people. Um, I think another barrier is they're afraid they're going to get kicked out of their existing group. Mm. I see that with parents all the time. Like parents have a lifestyle. They have a certain tribe. And there's a real issue going on with their kiddo, right? Their son, their daughter. And, you know, they don't want to say, you know what, we're, we got to get out of the wine club. Or I don't want to stop smoking weed. I mean, you know, this, this, or that's not my problem. You know, I don't want to associate with it. Um, that, that, that's a huge, that's still a huge barrier, Derek. Yeah. It, it, it really is. And then, you know what the other barrier is, quite frankly? I mean, this is just being brutally honest. A yep. lot of people just don't want to work on themselves. Mm. I mean, yep. that, that saying, I don't want to go there, is, there's a lot of truth to that, right? I mean, I don't want to unravel the onion, yeah. the, right? the, the onion layers. I, I, yeah. I'm making a commitment, you know, there's a lot of change, right, that and there's a lot of things that kind of go with that change, you know? Yeah. I had to flip back through my notebook, uh, with a client. It might've even been this morning, uh, that I was working with because this kind of exact same thing came up and I couldn't remember exactly what I had written in my notebook or where I even heard it. Um, I'm not brilliant enough to have come up with it on my own. So I know that I heard it from somewhere and jotted it down. Right. Um, but it said one of the biggest things that keeps people stuck in addiction, um, is even though the addiction is painful, it's predictable. And change comes with a huge um, unknown factor. What's going to happen if I change? What, what all these fears about what's out there in the darkness that I don't know, at least I know what to expect if I stay locked into my addiction. Yes. Yeah. Wait, and that, that, that really is tragedy because eventually you don't get another shot at it. Yeah. Well, you don't No, it's, it's, you're right. You know, that, 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 that comfort zone, I know that that could get worn out at times that saying, but it really is the truth. Like I know what I have today, right? I know I can call my dealer. I know I could do this. I know I, you know, the, like your survival skills, you know, are, 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 are messed up, but 
yeah. you know, they're, they're kicking in, in in that aspect of it. Um, you know, the other piece too is, is like when you, when you make a decision to really go out on your, on your own in a sense of family systems, uh, culture, right? Like you're going to be the one that's going to leave that nest. You're going to be the one that's going to, you know, and there's a lot of people that, you know, don't want to do that. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I can't drink with you anymore. Yeah. You know, and then it kind of becomes like, I think, you know, in the beginning too, a, a, a tough thing to continue is people that are still sick, don't want to be around people that are going on a different path and healing. And that will work itself out. Like, and that's just life. Um, I just want to encourage anybody to say, you know what, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to be true to thine own self, right. And make that change. And especially like in, in, in family systems and family dynamics, you know, um, generational stuff, right. Layers and years and years and years. I mean, when you make a decision to break out, you know, I think that it, it's really scary. Yeah. It's scary. Yep. You know, but boy, you know, it's so worth it. It is. It's at the end of the day, right? We only have one life to live. It's so, yeah. you know, you got to go for it. Um, man, Eddie, I know that I've, I've known you in terms of name and reputation for a long time. I think this may be one of the first times we've ever actually like engaged in conversation or that I've heard a little bit of your story. Um, man, like just and I'm like, I'm not like just bullshitting or blowing smoke. Can I say that on Parents Helping Parents podcast? Sure. Um, sure. We've all <laughs> I'm, heard I'm a lot in, first. I'm in charge tonight, right? I can say whatever I want. And I'll, I'll get an email about that from somebody. Um, like, like not, not to blow smoke, man. I don't know if anybody could like have a conversation with you and not feel your heart and passion for people and for recovery and I mean, it just, it, it just radiates from your soul that like you love this and that like, you, and that this is what you do. And I mean, I just appreciate just the authenticity um, that I get from talking to you. It's fantastic. Thank you, Derek. I mean, it's, it's been a beautiful and blessed life. Um, life on life's terms, right? But it's gratitude. Yeah. That was the other thing I wanted to say about that one thing right? Gratitude over happiness always. Yeah. If I would have depended on happiness, I'd have drank a long time ago. Mm, man, that's great. That's great. I'm gonna write that down. While, while I'm writing this down, and I might have to have you repeat that. Gratitude over happiness, if I depended on happiness, I'd drink a long time ago. I'll remember it now. Yes. Um, hey, one of the questions that I always ask the guests is if you had two minutes, 120 seconds to deliver a single thread message to a family, or to an individual that might be struggling tonight, what would your two minute message to them, to them be? To the person that's struggling? Yeah, or their family. Or their family. I just want to tell you that there is hope. There is hope and there is help. Get around some really great people. And I just want to encourage you one day at a time. And I know that's used really, really, you know, when you're new, sometimes you don't want to hear that, but there is hope, there is help, and there is healing. Take a deep breath and go on a journey that will change your life. It's not going to be easy. I'm not going to, you know, you know, bullshit you but it is so worth it. It is so worth it. Um, recovery is a beautiful life. It's a grateful life and it's a purpose driven life. And each of us can make a change. And that little shift 
will lead to many beautiful things in your life and you'll be able to help others, you know? So that's, yeah. that's my, right. yeah. thank you so much, man. Hey, I would be um, very disappointed if I didn't give the opportunity to talk about Casa Colina just for a few minutes, sure. just kind of feel like give people the elevator pitch, who you guys are, what you sure. do, how to get in touch with you. For people that are listening, I've already tagged Casa Kalina's Facebook page and website in the Facebook comment section. Um, so if you need to connect with them, um, feel free to do it that way. Or if Eddie's brave enough, he can put his um, phone number out on the internet, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, no, always, always on that. You, you can put my cell phone uh, out there, Derek, because it's okay. really important. Absolutely. Um, you know, Casa Kalina, we are in Waxahachie, Texas. So uh, we are on 220 acres, about uh, uh, just south of Dallas. Um, very convenient for our Oklahoma families. Um, you know, Casa Kalina is a family owned treatment center. The Campbell family, John Campbell is the CEO and owner. He is a therapist. Um, I said 220 acres. We are a strong clinical program for men only. We are not a census driven program. We are 22 beds. We deal with uh, men 18 and up. Uh, we take insurance. We're in network with Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, and Health Choice, which is a very big pro, uh, uh, you know, insurance company in Oklahoma as well. Um, we really work with trauma, addiction, and other co-occurring um, mental health issues. We have six master's level therapists. Um, we do intensives. Our 90-day program is our tried and true. Uh, we do a minimum of 45 days, and we get down to root causes and conditions. So men do the work, full equine full art therapy, over 25 hours of clinical work per week. Um, we're abstinence-based. We do 12 steps. So um, one of our big, uh, I would say one of our big, and a full family program. So that's a really big deal as parents helping parents as we're on this, right? Yeah. I do want to say that a gentleman is assigned a, primary therapist and the families and, and, and a family therapist. So uh, the, the families, if, if they're allowed to, our primary therapist will work with the family uh, each week for the entire 90 days leading up to a tremendous three-day family intensive on our campus. Um, the other big piece of Casa Kalina is every five weeks, Mary Bellafado comes in and does a two day intensive psychodrama intensive. Mm. Uh, she trains everybody at onsite. She is the lead uh, trainer for all the therapists at a, at a place called onsite, which is another wonderful, you know, uh, organization. And uh, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough. Our tagline is welcome home. And uh, it's truly a place that you would send. I would send a family member. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, uh, hey, just out of curiosity, um, and this isn't for the podcast, this is for me. Yes. Um, are, you, are you guys open to visiting therapists, therapists coming and observing that psychodrama intensive? That, that stuff fascinates me. That I'd have to ask. Yeah, I don't find out for me for that, but you know, yeah. that, you know. We can that, talk about it more tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, excellent, man. Eddie, man, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time. Um, you could, people could be doing lots of things on a Monday night. Um, we're blessed to have had you joined us. We're blessed to have had everybody else that joined us um, watching. So thank you so much, brother. Um, I will text you uh, the info. We will hook up tomorrow afternoon um, and it'll be my pleasure. Maybe if we've got time, I'll take you for a slice, my treat. That would be fantastic. Very grateful for the opportunity and wishing everyone the very, very best um, in their journey. Take care. Excellent. Thanks, Eddie.